but only briefly, is uh, before we move forward, I, I'm suspecting the Lord's going to take me to the next chapter uh, in the following weeks, uh, just because of where the study's been. So Second Chronicles chapter number 12, and um, I want to touch down on, on one particular area because of its um, impact, because of the the idea behind it and what it means in the life of Rehoboam, but what it certainly means to you as Christians, uh, trying to walk in this world circumspectly, uh, making sure that you live a life that's becoming of the gospel of Christ, one that glorifies the Lord in all areas. And that is why we return back here tonight. And so, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll just be here for a moment and then we're going to look in, in Proverbs and a couple of places in Proverbs, and the parallel passage is actually where we'll turn in just a moment um, in uh, the book of Kings. But here in Second Chronicles chapter number 12, I want you to look at one verse, verse number 7. This is following the things that have taken place. Um, this is where the Lord now has spoken to Rehoboam, and he comes to this verse with Rehoboam and the princes bowing themselves down, humbling themselves yet again before the Lord. And because they do, he is going to say something to them. He says this in verse number seven, and when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah saying, they have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening and ask you, Lord God, to show us from your word those things which you'd have us to see, those things that you'd have us to hear. And God, I pray that you would be magnified, glorified in all things tonight. May we leave out of here chains for your betterment, for your use, for thine glory. For it's in Christ's name I do pray. Amen. This would be, I guess, the really the final point of the messages that have been tied together, the fourth part, if you will, and perhaps the one that had we had Rehoboam taken notice of this um, idea that his father teaches in the book of Proverbs, and we'll see that here in just a moment. If he would have taken notice of the things going on around him, he would not have found himself in the position that he found himself in. This final point, and it'll be the only one I have, so uh, maybe it'll be a short message tonight. We'll see. It is this simple thought, he is seen from heaven. He is seen from heaven. Turn over to 1 Kings, uh, just a few pages back. We find some context given in 1 Kings that it's not given in the book of Chronicles uh, that helps us to understand the day and age. And it's ironic to me, uh, it's fitting to me to find Rehoboam the way he is considering the conditions of the time in which he lived are parallel, very similar to the day and age in which we live. And also, as we uh, were there and for that reason, we, we see that Rehoboam is much like the Christians are today, up and down and just constantly struggling to have a, a sincere walk with God. Here in 1 Kings in chapter number 14, let's read a few verses here and, and grab the context that is found that's given here in the book of Kings. The Bible says this, And Rehoboam the son of Solomon reigned in Judah... Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nemeah, the an Amoritus. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now understand as we begin reading verse number 22 that this is the condition of the land that we read about in 2 Chronicles 12. It says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they, had also, uh, for they also built them high places, images, and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You know, the Bible tells us, which we read in verse number 7, that the eyes of the Lord are upon us all the time. 
He's watching the good and the bad. He's, he's observing the things that are going on. He's uh, looking at us and, and paying close attention to us. And God always sends somebody to deliver a message concerning the day and age in which they're in to prepare them for the things that He will have done. Rehoboam is no exception to this. Rehoboam steps onto the scene as we've already looked at and I'm trying to stir up into remembrance for this reason that Rehoboam represents so many Christians in today's day and age. But Rehoboam forgot that God's eyes are upon him. And I would venture to say this evening that many of us often throughout our day, even uh, even once we walk out of here, we may forget it before midnight strikes tonight that God's eyes are upon us all the time. Rehoboam here, we, we find of all the things that he was doing here in First Kings, we find that Rehoboam is living in a day and age which is very similar, eerily similar to the day which we live in. It says that Judah did evil in the sight, you see that word there, in the sight of the Lord, verse 22, And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed above all that their fathers had done. What provokes somebody to jealousy? It's when they've been replaced. Uh, A wife or a husband may become jealous when somebody's given them of their spouse more attention. That's what's taking place here. Judah has replaced God with gods. And the Bible says in verse 24 that Sodomites were in the land. Anytime Sodomites are mentioned in the Bible, it's at the the greatest um, apathy. It's a moment of great apathy and of great disgusting sin. They're only on the scene when uh, there's other abominations taking place. And if you're not familiar with what an abomination of, in order to be an abomination, it has to violate three laws. The law of God, the moral law, and the natural law. And when those three laws are violated, that becomes an abomination. In other words, an abomination is this. It works against all that is seemingly, all that is normal. And to to read here in verse 24, that, and the reason that God would put this in there, that Sodomites were in the land, is to help us to understand what was going on around them and they were flippantly playing in the world. They were dabbling, if you would. You remember back in 2 Chronicles, last week we visited this, when when he took instruction from the young men. Those young men would have been much like the generation of today. Their their ideas are about uh, uh, everybody coming together. You remember the old men said, hey, listen, if you lift the burden... They will come under you and they'll follow you. And the, old men, uh, the young men said, no, put more pressure upon them and then you'll have them under your control. You'll have power. Well, it sounds an awful like, a lot like the things going on today. And ironically, there's sodomites in the land. And the reason this is brought forth and the reason I keep bringing your attention to it is because you must understand the depravity of the situation in which they're in. Do you realize that the reason that Rehoboam was up and down is because he was influenced by men. Though he knew God and he had seen the power and the working of God, he had friends over here in the world. And he wasn't willing to depart from them, so there was always this up and down because he didn't want to uh, displease those people that were close to him or around him. But he would rather displease God than those influences there. I want, you to, I want to try to paint for you a picture tonight And we'll move fairly quickly from this point concerning the eyes of the Lord. We first get an insight look at what God sees and what He's looking for when we see the passage found in 1 Samuel where God is uh, helping instruct Samuel to look for the next king who's going to reign in Saul's stead. And the Bible says this in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For the Lord looketh on the out, uh, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And tonight I would remind you of this very thought: that God is looking upon our hearts. 
and he's looking and watching and not only trying to see what it is uh, that we're doing and trying to ponder, the Bible says, and we're going to look at this verse in just a moment, that God ponders our paths and our ways. I want you to see in Proverbs, let's go over to the book of Proverbs here for a few minutes because as we begin to look at the eyes of the Lord and how they go to and fro, you know the Bible gives instruction for us concerning the eyes of the Lord. We find in the Bible many a times, matter of fact, the phrase in the eyes of the Lord or in the sight of the Lord. It's found so many times that it ought to, when I begin the study, uh, it almost put me into a panic in in the sense that I had to get before God and I did not realize how much he's looking upon me. I forget those things. But in Proverbs chapter 16, if you'll turn over there, and let's look at a few passages here. Because these Proverbs are written by none other than Rehoboam's dad, Solomon. We've brought him up over and over again because uh, really he, he's written these Proverbs. And so oftentimes, like in, in the 16th Proverb, we find again some words spoken uh, in, in the very beginning the very first verse, we find something that makes us scratch our head concerning Rehoboam. Look what it says, the preparations of the heart in a man. And the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. But now we begin this study last Sunday morning in the 14th verse of 2 Chronicles chapter 12 where the Bible says he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. And yet, with that uh, as his epitaph, the final uh, saying, I suppose, of his word, uh, what is said of him by God in Scripture, is that he did not prepare his heart, but his daddy said very clearly right here, the preparations of the heart in a man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. This leads me to understand why all that took place in Rehoboam's life and how so many people followed him, the, the end of chapter number one, of verse number 1 in chapter 12, remember it said, in all Israel with him, because he did not walk with God and because he forgot that the eyes of the Lord were upon him and seeking him and watching him and watching his way, he led all of Israel astray to the point of complete takeover and destruction of not only the economy, but the people. Ironically, we find this again, if you'll turn back in Proverbs, more instruction from Solomon, his father, in chapter number 5. Look at chapter number 5 in the book of Proverbs. My son, attend unto my wisdom. Now hold on, let's rewind. He starts off, my son. I don't know if he's speaking directly to Rehoboam because undoubtedly with, with a thousand wives, you're certain to have more than one son, but he's speaking to his children. And most likely, given the fact that this is being written from a king and it's the type of instruction that it is, it's given for us, it's given for all of his children, but it must certainly must have been to Rehoboam, the future heir of the kingdom of Israel. And he begins with these words, My son, attend uh, unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear unto my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Boy, he's starting off very strong language to his son, but certainly after having traversed the globe and having seen and spoken to people from all places, having dabbled in everything you can imagine, everything under the sun, even trying drunkenness to see if there's any gain to it, Solomon is speaking wise words to his son and instructing him how to not fall flat on your face. He goes on to say this, and this this entire chapter, by the way, is speaking really of avoiding adultery, but watch what words are found hidden within the context of this passage. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. 
But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell. Now watch this. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are not movable, and thou canst not know them. I want you to jump all the way ahead. Verse 14. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Verse 21, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Now I made mention just a few moments ago that Solomon had traversed the world and he had experienced many things and had dabbled in many things. And verse 14 alludes to that when he says, I was almost in all evil. He says, I was basically this close to all, uh, all evil would be to assume that he was that close to worshiping the devils that Jer- Jeroboam raised up an anointed priest to worship. But Solomon says he got that close even in the midst of the assembly, in the midst of the congregation. And you know what I find eerily uh, similar to Rehoboam's life and the words of instruction that he has just completely thrown aside is the Bible tells us concerning those shields of gold that they were there at the Lord's house and what happened after they were taken was he returned and made himself shields of brass. And he went back to the Lord's house being in all evil. Now Solomon's giving a very clear warning to his son. He's saying, listen, I've been where you've been. I've seen all these things for myself. Take it from me that it's best that you be found guiltless in the eyes of the Lord than to try to explore the the pleasures of sin that last but for a season. But it was that final verse I read to you a moment ago in verse uh, 21 that drew my attention because the Bible says, and I I touched on this this morning, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. The same word that's found here concerning pondering is the same word that's found in verse 6 of pondering. It says this in verse 21, basically that word pondering means that it's a a, a, a path prepared, rolled out as in a road paved before him. God, he's telling his son, he's saying, listen to me, the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. And God is watching you and he's going to make every effort possible to put you back on the right path. When he sees you getting off track, his way's over here and he's going to try to uh, take you and get you over here. You know what happens though so oftentimes is God comes into our life and we hear that and we get back to church and we get back to reading the Bible and we get back to praying and we get back to a little walk with God and as we're making our way back over here, the detour back to the straight and narrow, we find another path to begin. And it seems like God's eyes are always upon us, bringing us back and bringing us back and bringing us back. Look back in verse number 6 though where this word is found first. And it says, Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. The entire warning that Solomon gives is if you'll trust God that His sight and what He sees for you is better for you than what you think is best for you, you'll stay out of danger. He said the most dangerous thing you can do, son, listen, Lest uh, is talking about that adulterous woman, that woman is uh, lips or is a honeycomb. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Do you want to know how you get to a place where Rehoboam is in such a day as this? You're creating your own path, your own way through this life. That's the same word meaning to lay out a path as to pave a road. Your intention is to do it your way and not God's way. And the very thing that will lead you away from the eyes of the Lord, but he beholds the good and the evil, as we'll see here in just a moment, the thing that leads you away from what God says is the right way and what has led to a nation in this day and age, just the same as the day and age in which we live in, is because men are pondering their own path in life and trying to create their own miraculous wonder. And it leads them every time to a place 
of absolute destruction. Now, if we could grasp this very simple concept tonight, that he is seen from heaven, that you are seen from heaven, that I am seen from heaven, even knowing that God right now is looking down upon this congregation meeting in this very moment and his eyes are upon us, not seeing us sitting in a pew, but rather he looks into the depths of your heart and knows exactly what you're thinking about at this very moment. That's the thing that will steer our attention to serving our God. That's the thing that will keep us from the destruction that lies ahead in the thought life. The, the deep, dark intents of the heart where Solomon says in verse 14, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. He's saying, listen, I was right there sitting when there's preaching and praising and, and, and prayer and, and, and scripture being read right in the middle of all that. In here, I was in the midst of all evil. I was right there, wicked thoughts. And God, His eyes being upon us, has throughout Scripture given us and warnings to know that it's our duty to fill our minds with the Word of God. And that's what will cause you to keep the, from going the up and down and in the circle uh, just continuously circling back to the bad things and stumbling over the same stumbling blocks. Proverbs 32 verse 8 says this, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, and I will go, uh, guide thee with mine eye. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. But Job said it this way, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. He's watching our path, the path we're headed down, and he's trying to stop us. And it's not just talking about the literal walking. That's why I'm talking about your mind tonight. God's looking into your heart. He's looking into your mind. And the single thing that causes Christians to go up and down in their walk with God is their thought life. Job realized that in, the, in his deep moments of depression when he had lost everything. And he was still able to say almost verbatim long before Solomon. Maybe Solomon was quoting him. We don't know. But he says it in, in his own language. He says, the eyes are upon the ways of man and he seeth all his goings. The Bible tells us that we are to think on whatsoever things are true and pure and lovely and all those good things that God lists. In other words, and, and if you take all that and condense it down, it's to think on the words of God. If we meditate upon the words of God, then our walk with God in the eyes of God will not be found wanting. Listen what God says in, in His Word concerning those that are good. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward them, toward him. Herein thou, shalt, uh, thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. They were walking with God and then they turned away from God and went to their own ways. And God said he saw both. And he rewarded and he destroyed. Proverbs 33, 18 and 19, we find this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. You see, the promise that God gives us who try to walk as, as circumspectly as they can through this life God says, I'll take care of you even in the midst of a famine. You'll not go hungry. I'm reminded of Joseph. And, you know, we, we, we look at Joseph's life, and I try to put myself into the, the shoes of Joseph. Noah's another good example. To think about the life that he was going through, and yet he held on to his integrity. 
He held on to the integrity knowing that the eyes of the Lord were upon him. In the pit he cried out to his brothers and his brothers. Uh, he could hear them making dealings with the slave owners coming by as they bought him. And as he rode away, undoubtedly his cries went before them. And he, he could see them just disappearing in the distance knowing that his life would never be the same and hoping that maybe his dad would come to save him. But as that vanished out of sight and the days turned into weeks, undoubtedly in Joseph's heart there became some time of um, unrest, some questioning as to how he could walk such a life and God let him get to this point in his life. I believe that many Christians today are looking at their nation they're looking at the politics and the government. They're looking at their financial system, a, a, a situation. They're looking at their household and the conditions in which they find themselves. And like Joseph would have cried out and wondered and questioned God, they have a choice to make. God promises us to keep us. He promises those who... Uh, do good and are good, he'll keep alive. And for Joseph, we know the end of the story, that he would reign uh, only under Pharaoh, becoming the highest man. Imagine that, a man who's not even an Egyptian. Matter of fact, he was a slave, is now the highest ruler in the land next to Pharaoh. That's what God can do with you and through you as his eyes behold you, and he watches to see whether you be good or evil. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry for the good, for those who seek God and continually walk with him. He hears your cries. And I would tell you this evening that there is persecution coming in this country. And it would behoove us to make sure that God will hear our cries in those times because that persecution is at the door. Just as in their day, in Rehoboam's day, there was hatred for those Levites, and that's another day, another time, but there was a hatred for those who walked after God. There is today. And we want our God to hear our cry. For the bad, the Bible says this, speaking in Hebrews 4.12, uh, reminding that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God sees when there's a wicked thought going on. And he says this about it, there, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. God is watching us. His eyes are upon us. And my dear friend, we must recognize our own life Knowing and seeing our own thoughts and knowing how desperately wicked our hearts can be, we must observe our own self because what happens in Rehoboam back in Second Chronicles, what happens to him is God looks at him and sees him only after he humbles himself. Verse number 7. It says, and when the, the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, now his word comes concerning the judgment that's before him. And Rehoboam, like so many other times, has an opportunity now in the sight of God to do the right thing. The message is nearly over, but I bring us back here for this reason that I could have, we could have really just read this one verse and considered the fact that God's eyes are upon us and then had an invitation to allow us to make sure things are right. Because, my dear friends, what takes place here will very much happen to this church and to your families and to this community, except we recognize that the eyes of the Lord are constantly upon us. In, verse, in the latter part of verse number 7, they have humbled themselves, and I will not destroy them. I will grant them some deliverance. God's eyes are upon you, and it's, it's most important that we recognize that they're on us right here. In this, I'm talking to our congregation tonight. Because the Bible says that judgment must first begin 
of the house of God. Now, the summary of the entire message tonight is for this reason, that the eyes of the Lord are also upon the nation outside these doors. And what God has seen and what God has been seeing for the last several decades is great wickedness in this land. And there are sodomites in the land, and there is uh, great abominations in the land. And as we've already looked at, the reason that's so important is because it shows the great depravity of where we are. And just as God is sending in somebody to destroy Judah in this day and age, you can mark it down, my dear friends, that God's eyes have behold the great abominations that have taken place in this nation with the murder of so many innocent children through abortion and so many other wicked things that have been done. His eyes have beheld great wickedness and judgment is at the door. And tonight, from this verse, God grants some deliverance not because of those sodomites and the wicked people that are there. He grants some deliverance simply because some men who are always struggling, who could never get it right, Rehoboam and his princes and young men, because they were willing to humble themselves, God granted some deliverance. And if this nation has any hope, it's going to take his people, judgment beginning at the house of God, to humble themselves knowing that his eyes are upon us continually. And knowing this also, that if his eyes are upon us continually and we still choose to bypass those who are in need and those who are uh, uh, in desperate need, not only of the gospel, I'm talking about physical needs too. When we bypass and we have the means to help that person, whatever it is, whether it's monetary or just putting your arm upon around them and encouraging them, we are heaping to ourselves judgment in our own ways. The warning is given here because God's eyes are upon them and He's watching them, that He also is willing to restore them. Because what's going to take place in the next chapter And what's going to take place in two generations following his grandson? The Bible's going to say this, that he did good in the sight of the Lord. From David to Rehoboam was two generations. From Rehoboam to his grandson is two generations. It went from walking with God to uh, abandoning God and sodomites in the land and great wickedness and great destruction. An enemy has taken over and brought them into bondage to right back to God prospering them again. And so I'm telling you this tonight because if the Lord should tarry, and he may tarry another thousand years, But if he's going to tarry, then we must become aware, acutely aware that God's eyes are upon us because that's where the turn begins to take place. When you're aware that somebody's watching you, you're on your best behavior. (laughs) When you're in the store and somebody's watching you or you're, uh, here's a good example, when you're driving down 30 and you see that trooper and you know he's got his radar on you, you're certainly under the speed limit. But when he's not around and when the cat's away, the mice will play. The eyes of the Lord are upon us day and night. And all the time he's watching to see if we will turn. And can I tell you what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that you already know? That if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, they'll pray and they'll seek my face they'll turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. Because he turns his ear, attended. He turns his ear to hear all that the good say, all that the righteous say. And he makes a promise to you today. And you hold in your hand the same power that Rehoboam held in 2 Chronicles 12. He said, I will heal your land. It's not the the liberals or the Democrats or, or those who are against God who will destroy this nation. It's the unrepentant, unhumbled children of God that will destroy this nation. And we must know that God's eyes are upon us 
all the time, every head bowed, every eye closed, we'll have a moment of invitation. As I said already, this is a simple message on the understanding and the thought that God's, God's eyes are upon us all the time. Every time I open up the book of Second Chronicles, I find again a young man who so fittingly fits right in to our day and our age. My dear friends, as you're there in your pew tonight, as the pianist plays, there's been invitation after invitation since I've been here as the pastor. And it's always the same to get right with God, but tonight, tonight, I would ask you this. When God looked down this week upon your life, did He see you bypass another lost soul? Or did He see you stop and witness? You may have been rejected, but did you try? God left us here to do the work of an evangelist. The Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. And if we know that God's eyes are upon us, then how do we let these lost sinners walk on by? I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but the Spirit of God can do His own work in your heart, my dear friends. I'm begging you. Let's ask God to heal this land. Let judgment begin in our own hearts.